OJ Simpson is dead. At least now he can rest knowing that his wife's killer has been brought to justice. That was hands down the best Norm MacDonald uh, impression on social media, but here's the legal question. Will the estate of OJ's victims finally be able to get compensation? When Simpson went on trial for murdering his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman, it was called the trial of the century. Simpson had a prior record of domestic violence toward Nicole, and she told friends and family that he was going to kill her. Brown and Goldman were brutally stabbed to death outside of Nicole's home in Brentwood. And after a polarizing 18-month trial, a jury acquitted O.J. Simpson of all charges on October 3rd, 1995. Now today, the mainstream legal view is that the jury got it wrong. And a little over a year later, Ron Goldman's father, Fred, uh, brought a civil action for wrongful death against Simpson. And in 1997, a jury found Simpson personally liable for the deaths of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman in a civil court and ordered OJ to pay $33.5 million in compensatory and punitive damages to the victim's families. Simpson then spent 30 years trying to avoid paying the victim's families, in part by settling in Florida, where state laws offered him a unique protection from judgment collection. But then OJ Simpson wrote a book called If I Did It, a ghoulish first person hypothetical account of Brown and Goldman's murder. Here he is explaining what definitely happened. I just remember Nicole fell and hurt herself. And uh, this guy kind of got into a karate thing. And I said, well, you think you can kick my ass? And I remember I grabbed a knife. I do remember that portion, taking a knife from Charlie. And to be honest, after that, I don't remember. Except I'm standing there and it's all kind of stuff around and um um what kind of stuff but and stuff around but simpson has been trying to avoid the judgments ever since but now that he's dead can the victims finally recover that's what we're going to be talking about today now if you're not old enough to remember the world before smartphones you probably have no idea who oj simpson is so for all of my gen z subscribers here's a brief history lesson now ornthal james simpson more commonly known as oj or the juice is regarded as one of the most talented running backs in american football history and one of the least terrible people to come out of usc Go Bruins. Now, after nine seasons with the Buffalo Bills and two more with the San Francisco 49ers, Simpson retired from football in 1979 and was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1985. After football, Simpson pursued a career in sports commentary and acting. Simpson's most famous acting role was the dim-witted detective Nordberg from the Naked Gun trilogy. Nordberg, that's wonderful. Whoa! Come, Frank. Everyone should have a friend like you. Simpson was also a spokesman for a variety of companies, most prominently Hertz Rental Cars, where the ex-running back could be seen leaping over luggage and other obstacles to catch a flight, which was still better than the Tom Brady Love Hertz commercial that no one can escape from. Sometimes I just want to rent a car. Go! And if you didn't follow Simpson's career before his fall from grace, it might be difficult to understand just how unthinkable it was to picture him as a murderer. But according to a 2019 interview with Arnold Schwarzenegger, Simpson was the producer's first choice to play the eponymous Terminator in the Terminator movies, but director James Cameron nixed the idea because he felt OJ wasn't believable as a killing machine. But one person who believed that OJ was capable of killing was his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson. During their seven year marriage, the LAPD visited the Simpson home eight times in response to domestic abuse calls. On the morning of January 1st, 1989, a bloody and bruised Nicole sprinted toward responding officers screaming, he's going to kill me, he's going to kill me. After officers told OJ that he would be taken into custody, they let him go back into his home to get dressed where he proceeded to jump into his Bentley and flee the scene and temporarily avoid arrest. And Simpson would later plead no contest to spousal abuse. But while prosecutors recommended jail time and group counseling, the presiding judge gave Simpson a sweetheart deal. He was placed on two years probation, ordered to perform 120 hours of community service, which he never completed, and was allowed to do counseling on the phone. Simpson was never fingerprinted, which means no police record. In 1992, Nicole Brown Simpson filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. Two years later, Nicole was found brutally stabbed to death with her friend Ron Goldman, and a warrant was issued for the arrest of her ex-husband, O.J. Simpson. Now, the O.J. Simpson case triggered a media firestorm that was illustrated by the infamous white Bronco chase. Despite previously agreeing to turn himself in, Simpson, carrying a passport, a disguise, and almost $9,000 in cash, escaped in his white Ford Bronco, driven by his friend A.C. Cowlings. Earlier today, uh, Robert Shapiro had arranged for O.J. to turn himself in. Doctors were in attendance. They were all gonna go together in a car because they were worried about suicide. When they went downstairs from a conference room in O.J.'s house, he was gone. When Simpson pointed a gun at his own head, Cowlings led the LAPD on a low-speed pursuit across L.A. as the entire nation watched live. After Simpson surrendered, he was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. 
In a trial to secure a criminal conviction, the prosecution had to prove O.J. Simpson was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. But Simpson had assembled the famous dream team of lawyers who defended him, including legal powerhouses like Robert Shapiro, Johnny Cochran, Ethley Bailey, Robert Kardashian, and Alan Dershowitz. And Team Simpson exploited every possible opportunity to argue to the jury that there was reasonable doubt about their client's guilt. Famously, attacking the credibility of the LAPD was central to the Simpson defense strategy. The defense portrayed them as racially biased, sloppy with evidence, and out to get OJ. And in particular, the defense focused its ire on Mark Furman, the LAPD detective who found the infamous bloody glove on Simpson's property. During trial, Furman denied under oath that he ever used the N-word in the previous 10 years. And to prove that Furman was lying, the defense introduced a series of privately recorded interviews with the screenwriter, where the officer repeatedly used the N-word to refer to black suspects, and made many references implying that uh, planting evidence in police brutality against African Americans were common practices in, in the LAPD. And you might recall that in the 90s, things were extremely charged when it came to the LAPD in LA. The LAPD had been criticized for its chummy relationship with celebrities like Simpson, but the department also faced many credible allegations of racial bias in its treatment of black suspects. In 1992, the LAPD was caught on camera viciously beating Rodney King after he had briefly fled a traffic stop. And though four officers were charged with assault and excessive force, a jury did not convict them of any crimes. And when the officers were acquitted, it triggered the LA riots, one of the most destructive US civil disturbances in the 20th century. So with Rodney King fresh in the jurors' mind, the Furman tapes reinforced the LAPD's problems with racial bias. A year later, Furman pleaded no contest to perjury for lying about his use of racial slurs on the stand, and Furman is now a uh, forensic and crime scene expert for Fox News. And in perhaps the most memorable moment of the trial, Simpson tries on the gloves he's accused of wearing during the murder. Simpson appears to struggle, grimacing and stating too tight, loud enough for the jury to hear. This was despite the fact that he was taking the fifth and refusing to testify at trial. Now, his lawyer, Johnny Cochran, would cite this incident repeatedly during closing arguments with an infamous rhyming refrain. If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. And following 11 months of trial and less than four hours of deliberation, the jury found Simpson not guilty on all counts on October 3rd, 1995. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant or Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. And as Ron Goldman's father, Fred, left the courtroom, he turned towards Simpson and muttered one word, murderer. At a post-verdict news conference, Fred Goldman, surrounded by family and the defeated prosecution, tearfully expressed his heartbreak at OJ's acquittal. Last um, June 13th, 94, was the um, worst nightmare of my life. This is the second. Now the state's evidence heading into trial seemed overwhelming. Simpson's blood was found at the murder scene. Blood, hair, and fibers from Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman were found in Simpson's car and at his home. A single bloody glove was found at the scene, while a second matching glove was found at O.J. Simpson's estate. And bloody shoe prints found at the scene matched those shoes owned by Simpson. So how could the prosecution lose? Well, for starters, the use of DNA evidence in murder trials was relatively new at the time, and the jury might not have fully grasped just how conclusive such evidence can be, and invariably how hard it would be to fake. Uh, others have suggested credibly that Simpson benefited from jury nullification to protest decades of LAPD malfeasance, especially in the shadow of uh, Rodney King. And critics have blamed the prosecution for sloppy and unforced strategic errors, like not using available peremptory challenges to keep an ex-Black Panther from the jury. And in addition, allowing Simpson to try on the glove amid concerns that it had shrunk after being soaked in blood was also a potential huge misstep that allowed OJ to seize the narrative of the trial. And to this day, the Brown and Goldman families continue to believe that O.J. Simpson got away with murder, as do pretty much everyone else. Now, obviously, if you commit double murder, you're gonna want a good lawyer, but Johnny Cochran has passed away. So if you want a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If there was an injury or death in the family, whether O.J. did it or not, if you've gotten in a car crash, suffered a data breach, especially if you've gotten one of those data breach letters that says your information might have been leaked, or dealing with workers' comp or social security, we can represent you or help find you the right attorney. Because it's so important to talk to a lawyer right away so you can get the best representation and find out what your options are. So just click on the link in the description or call the number that's on screen for a free consultation with my team. Because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle Team. So click on the link below. So following Simpson's acquittal, the victim's family sued him in civil court for wrongful death. 
And after a four month trial and three days of deliberation, the jury unanimously adjudged Simpson to be liable, meaning legally responsible. And prior to reaching the verdict, the jury asked the court reporter to read back hours of testimony relating to Simpson's alibi, his New Year's 1989 arrest for spousal abuse against Nicole, and the timeline for Simpson's limo driver who took him to the airport the night of the killings. So the jury awarded the victim's families $33.5 million in damages, 8.5 million in compensatory damages to the Goldmans, and 12.5 million in punitive damages each to the Goldman and Brown families. Now you might be wondering how one jury could find OJ liable for the exact same conduct, which another jury acquitted him of. Well, the Fifth Amendment's prohibition against double jeopardy prevents prosecutors from retrying a person for the same crime twice, but double jeopardy does not foreclose a civil suit on the same subject. And as explained by the Washington Post at the time, the standard for proving civil liability is much lower than criminal guilt. Quote, uh, in contrast to the criminal trial where jurors had to reach a verdict beyond a reasonable doubt, the civil jurors faced a much lower burden of proof. They only had to conclude whether Simpson was responsible for the deaths based on a preponderance of the evidence, which lawyers for the plaintiff stress meant that Simpson probably was the killer. And in the civil trial, Simpson had to testify because he couldn't raise his Fifth Amendment privilege. He could still choose not to testify, but the jury could take adverse inferences against that refusal. And the deposition proved to be explosive. Here's Goldman's lawyer, Daniel Petricelli, asking Simpson why blood from Brown and Goldman was found in his Ford Bronco and on his socks. Do you know why the blood on the counsel of the Bronco is consistent with a mixture of Ron Goldman's and Nicole's blood? No. Do you know why the blood on the socks in your bedroom match Nicole's blood? No. At one point, Simpson admits to wrestling Nicole and then admitted he abused her. Do you ever hurt her? Yes. Do you ever physically hurt her? Yes. Do you ever bruise her? Yes. Do you ever make her black and blue? Yeah. I think any marks that's on her, I take full responsibility for. I don't know what else you want me to do. I take total responsibility. Why? For it, because I shouldn't have handled the situation the way I did. And another factor that helped the civil case was the admission of evidence that had not been used in the criminal case, including photographs proving Simpson lied when he denied ever owning the brand of shoes that had left bloody footprints at the scene. In the criminal case, jurors never learned that a men's size 12 Bruno Mali brand shoe print stamped in the victim's blood was discovered at the crime scene. However, in the civil case, the lawyers showed the jury 30 photographs of Simpson wearing those shoes. Only 299 pairs of these shoes were ever sold in the United States. And in his deposition, Simpson said, Did you ever buy uh, shoes that you knew were Bruno Mali shoes? No, because I know if Bruno Magli makes shoes that look like the shoes they had in court that's involved in this case, I would have never worn those ugly ass shoes. But then you can see his reaction when he's confronted with photographs. And that is a picture of you looking at exhibit one, correct? It appears to be me, yes. And after hearing all the evidence, including over 100 witnesses and more than 2,500 exhibits, the jury found that there was a preponderance of the evidence that Simpson was responsible for the murder of Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman. And following the verdict, uh, Fred Goldman proclaimed to the crowd outside of the courthouse, we finally have justice for Ron and Nicole. But while this award seemed like a step towards justice, O.J. Simpson had a trick up his sleeve. After being found liable for millions of dollars, O.J. did what many others facing legal difficulties have done. He moved to Florida. That's because Florida provides a unique legal protection for anyone trying to avoid paying their debts, making it, in the words of the Tampa Tribune, a deadbeat's paradise. Here's how. Every state has some form of homestead exemption, which shields a certain amount of equity in one's home from being seized from creditors through for sale. For example, California's current homestead exemption provides a maximum of $600,000 of protection, adjusted yearly for inflation, but Florida's homestead exemption is particularly favorable to wealthy debtors like OJ. The state of Florida prohibits creditors to force an individual to sell its homestead in order to pay back a debt, including their heirs. Unlike other states, Florida's exemption from forced sale provides an even greater protection by not limiting the value of certain real property that can be protected from creditors. Had Simpson stayed in California, the victim's families could have forced him to sell assets to pay his judgment. But as a Florida resident, Simpson could put all of his money into his homestead and place his assets beyond the reach of creditors. Simpson also availed himself of the protections of federal law. Under the Employment Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA, creditors cannot satisfy a debt through pension funds. And because of ERISA, Simpson had millions of dollars invested in a personal pension and got paid thousands of dollars from his NFL pension that creditors couldn't touch. And Florida law also prevented Goldman from seizing Simpson's NFL pension. And as a result of these legal hurdles, the victim's families had to find creative ways to get any money from Simpson. So his Heisman Trophy was auctioned off for $500,000, but most of that money was used to pay expenses associated with these civil litigation. Now, after his high-profile criminal and civil trials, OJ's reputation never fully recovered for obvious reasons. 
But rather than retreat from the public eye, Simpson tried to stay relevant in increasingly bizarre ways. Like starring in his own prank show, Juiced, where he famously tried to sell a white Bronco to an unsuspecting person. You've been juiced. <laughs> <laughs> At a certain point, uh, Simpson gave up on rehabilitating his image and decided to cash in on his newfound, uh, maybe I'm a murderer mystique. So in November 2006, Reagan Books, an imprint of HarperCollins, announced it was publishing a book by Simpson entitled If I Did It, wherein OJ provides a hypothetical description of the murders of Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown. And at the time, Fox was affiliated with HarperCollins via News Corp, and it planned to air a two-day book promotion interview between journalists Judith Reagan and Simpson entitled OJ Simpson, If I Did It, Here's How It Happened. Uh, when the book and TV specials were announced, it sounded like a bad joke. And in fact, the Chris Rock show had predicted OJ would one day try to make money by describing hypothetically how he would have committed the murders. Hey, who can forget the night OJ came by to sell his new instructional videotape? I didn't kill my wife, but if I did, here's how I'd do it. But Simpson, who reportedly received an advance of $680,000 for If I Did It, described the book as blood money that he reluctantly took part in to pay his bills. He denied that the book was a confession and said that the hypothetical murder scenarios were written by a ghostwriter. And not surprisingly, after intense backlash, both the book and the TV special were canceled and Judith Reagan was fired. And despite the Goldman's prior opposition to the book, they decided that they could use OJ's ghoulish blood money book against him. And in July 2007, a federal bankruptcy judge awarded the Goldman family the publishing rights to If I Did It. The Brown family had opposed publication, stating that it would do nothing to bring Nicole back and urge people to boycott the book, but the Goldmans defended their decision to publish, with Fred describing the book as tantamount to Simpson's confession. He is doing a interview and a book to tell the world how he's decided, as far as I'm concerned, how he's decided he could have done it differently so that maybe he wouldn't be caught and he's gonna tell the world how he would have murdered his children's mother and my son in a book and on national TV. Well, Ron's sister Kim said that it was a rare victory against Simpson. Though once the Goldmans had the publishing rights, they made a few notable changes to maximize the hurt against OJ. For starters, the title was changed to If I Did It, Confessions of a Killer, and included additional commentary from the Goldman family entitled he did it. And to further needle Simpson, the word if on the cover is hidden in small gray print within the letter I, making the book appear to read, I did it, confessions of a killer. But generally speaking, the families have had an extremely hard time financially recovering from OJ Simpson. Uh, back in 2014, Ron Goldman's mother uh, put the unpaid judgment up for auction, but apparently had no takers. And according to a 2021 court filing, Simpson has only paid 132,000 of the original judgment. After decades of interest appreciation, the judgment is worth nearly $100 million. And in March, 2018, Fox aired the footage from the canceled interview uh, for the first time in the OJ Simpson, The Lost Confession. As Simpson recounts how he and his friend Charlie hypothetically murdered Ron and Nicole, uh, it starts to sound not particularly hypothetical and more like this guy just straight up got away with murder. Now, no one knows how much money Simpson had. He reportedly lived on his NFL and private pensions, and those payments stopped upon his death. If a person dies intestate, which means without will, then the probate court will determine how the assets are distributed to the person's heirs and creditors. When a person has a will, those assets will be distributed through the probate process. But when a person has a trust instead of a will, the estate will generally not go through the entire probate process. Instead, the assets will be distributed under the trust name without the court involvement. And the first issue for the Goldmans is determining where Simpson's property is located. For years, the media reported that Simpson was domiciled in Florida, and any Florida property would be protected by Florida's homestead exemption. However, Simpson's will was filed with the probate court in Nevada, where he died. The will appointed Las Vegas attorney Malcolm Laverne as Simpson's personal representative and executor. Laverne said he was surprised to be appointed, but he would do his best to stiff the Goldman family. He told the Las Vegas Review Journal that, quote, it's my hope that the Goldmans get zero, nothing, them specifically, and I will do everything in my capacity as the executor or personal representative to try and ensure that they get nothing. Now, the executor of the will is responsible for fulfilling the stipulations in the estate plan. However, he doesn't have the legal right to pick and choose who gets money. The executor has to disperse the estate's assets, first paying taxes and covering debts. And Laverne, after lots of public scrutiny, has reversed course. Quote, I can tell you in advance, Fred Goldman's claim will be accepted and his claim will be handled in accordance with Nevada law. And that's the right call since the Goldman's have a judgment lien against the estate. 
This is known as a secured debt. When it comes to creditors, there's a pecking order. The secured creditors are first in line, and the secured creditor is one whose claim is secured by a lien in the debtor's property. An unsecured creditor doesn't have a charge on a particular asset. An unsecured credit will only be paid if there's something left over after the secured creditors have been paid. And Simpson apparently owed taxes to the IRS, so taxes will be paid first, and those with a court judgment like Goldman's are probably next in line. And the executor is subject to oversight by the probate court. And we can actually look at Simpson's will. Article three states that he had a revocable living trust, quote, I give, devise, and bequeath all my property of every kind and character, wherever situated, whether community or separate, owned by me at my death, including any property over which I have power of testamentary disposition of the then acting trustee of the Orenthal Simpson revocable living trust dated January 25th, 2024, to be held, administered, and distributed according to the terms of said trust as it now exists, or maybe hereafter amended prior to my death. That will was filed by the Cassidy Law Offices, and Laverne wasn't aware that he had been named executor until the will was filed. So Simpson's property was placed into a revocable living trust. That's a trust that's an instrument that allows a person to bypass probate. Uh, the trust is a legal entity that Simpson created during his life, which holds all of his assets. And for the trust to be legally operable, it has to be funded. And a trust is funded if, before the person dies, he transfers title to all of his assets to the living trust. And the trustee is then responsible for gathering the trust assets and then distributing the assets to the trust death beneficiaries. Now, Simpson may have picked Nevada because its trust laws offer significant asset protection. In Nevada, a trust does not become public record and it remains private, which means that we won't know the identity of the beneficiaries nor what assets are held in trust or any of its terms. Most states tax trust income, but Nevada doesn't. And Nevada allows a person to create a self-settled spendthrift trust, which are commonly referred to as a domestic asset protection trust or DAPT. Uh, these trusts let the person who creates the trust to protect the assets from the reach of personal creditors. And Nevada is just one of two states that don't have exception creditors to spend thrift trusts. Exception creditors are certain classes of creditors who can penetrate the trust despite their being adapted in place. However, we don't know whether Simpson's trust meets the requirements of being a domestic asset protection trust. And the will calls the trust a revocable living trust that was established in January of 2024. In order for the trust to offer maximum asset protection, uh, it needs to be irrevocable. And revocable trusts are generally not free from creditors. And the Goldmans can still file a claim against that trust. And David Cook, the lawyer for the Goldman family said, quote, we have to start over here. We're going to work on that. The, there might be something out there. We've had this problem for a long time. It could be in a trust, it could be probate, it could be all gone. But if you're like OJ Simpson and you're going to go on TV and admit hypothetically to murdering people, you probably want a good clean shave to at least look innocent which you can do with today's sponsor, Henson Shaving. Henson is a great way to get a perfect shave without breaking the bank on crazy expensive cartridges. Now, you all know me as the beard wearing legal eagle lawyer, but I'll admit there's nothing that'll get a jury more suspicious of you than looking unkempt and sloppy. So keeping at least my neck and cheekbones clean is of utmost importance, or in the summer when I just shave it off, which is where Henson comes in. For the longest time, I've been using those insanely expensive razors with the disposable five blade heads, which work, but you go through cartridges quickly and they're insanely expensive. But here you can see the Henson AL-13, a single bladed safety razor. The engineering that went into this thing is immense. The Henson AL-13 razor is made using CNC machines to aerospace standards. And the razor is actually really clever because they designed it in such a way that's idiot proof to make sure that the blade is always seated 13 10 thousandths of an inch past the shave plane every single time. Henson blades only cost you 10 cents, so a year's worth of shaving might only cost three to five dollars. And obviously they're better for the environment, and yeah, it's better for your budget and everything else. And I can't tell any difference between the shave I get from Henson or the five bladed guy. Which is great because throwing out those huge plastic cartridges just seems like such a waste. And with my special promo code, you'll actually get 100 blades free, which could last for years. And that's why Henson isn't trying to sell you a subscription. Henson just makes really good quality razors. So if you decide you want to invest in a quality safety razor that works and will be drastically cheaper to own than the competitors, just click on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description. You can select which razor you'd like out of a variety of different colors. So go to the link that's on screen right now or down in the description and enter the code legal at checkout to get 100 free blades with your purchase. That's 100 free stainless steel double-edged replacement blades for free when both the blades and the razor are in your shopping cart. So again, click on the link below and use the code legal eagle to get 100 blades for free. After that, click on this link over here for more legal eagle or I'll see you in court.